This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. I'm Sue Ellen Thompson, and my guest today is Mark Doty, the author of nine books of poetry and three memoirs. Among his many prizes and honors are the National Book Award for Fire to Fire, New and Selected Poems, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, grants from the um, Guggenheim and Ingram Merrill Foundations, and I believe he is the only American poet ever to have won the T.S. Eliot Prize, which is given for the best book of poetry in English, first published in the UK. Mark, it's an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you, Sue Ellen. It's good to see you. Um, I'd like to begin by talking about your poetry. You have been described as a, a great poet of description, someone who uses description extensively in your work. And you have just published a book for Grey Wolf called mm -hmm. The Art of Description. Now, in a poem from your fourth book, Atlantis, you say, what is description, after all, but encoded desire? I wonder if you might be willing to read us a poem that shows off your descriptive powers and then talk a little about whether or not you think description alone is enough to make a poem. I'd be happy to. For me, a poem is almost always begin in an act of description when there's something I've seen that I want to capture come closer to, investigate. This happened one day in the Stop and Shop in Orleans, Massachusetts, when I found myself leaning over the counter in the fish market mm -hmm. section and unable to stop studying the mackerel, a display of mackerel. They lie in parallel rows on ice, head to tail, each a foot of luminosity barred with black bands which divide the scales, radiant sections, like seams of lead in a Tiffany window. Iridescent, watery prismatics. Think abalone, the wildly rainbowed mirror of a soap bubble sphere. Think sun on gasoline. Splendor and splendor, and not a one in any way distinguished from the other. Nothing about them of individuality. Instead, they're all exact expressions of the one soul, each a perfect fulfillment of heaven's template, mackerel essence, as if after a lifetime arriving at this enameling, the jewelers made uncountable examples, each as intricate in its oily fabulation as the one before. Suppose we could iridesce like these and lose ourselves entirely in the universe of shimmer would you want to be yourself only, unduplicatable, doomed to be lost? They'd prefer, plainly, to be flashing participants, multitudinous. Even now, they seem to be bolting forward, heedless of stasis. They don't care they're dead and nearly frozen, just as, presumably, they didn't care that they were living. All, all for all, the rainbowed school and its acres of brilliant classrooms in which no verb is singular or everyone is. How happy they seem, even on ice, to be together, selfless, which is the price of gleaming. Mm. Well, the poem began in an act of description, trying to use words to come closer to the physical world, closer to perception, to hold what one sees up for study. Mm -hmm. But I think a poem always has to travel somewhere else. Description is a, a platform, if you will, a diving board mm -hmm. to help us get to something uh, more profound in, in a way, I, I suppose, uh, an emotional connection, uh, an idea beneath the surface of things. When I see something like those fish and it seizes my attention, there's a reason for that. And my task as a writer is to try to figure out, why does this matter to me? Right. I don't want to right. just tell you how beautiful the fish right. are. There's got to be more than that. I didn't understand when I first saw those mm -hmm. dead creatures that I was really thinking about the one and the many. Mm -hmm. Are we 
single creatures contained in our little bags of skin? Or are we really the tribe, the, the group? Does life re reside in an individual or in the whole? And that question has occupied me as a poet um, for years in any number of ways. So my poem goes sidling up to that question. Uh, you know, suppose, you know, is it better to be an individual, which we know will vanish in time, or is it better to be a part of the stream of life? Are we both? Those are questions the poem, of course, can't answer, but it gave me great pleasure to articulate them and try to turn them around. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in Atlantis and in my Alexandria, you write extensively about the devastating effect that the AIDS epidemic had, um, not only on the gay community, but on your life. Mm -hmm. um, in Heaven's Coast, you write about losing your partner to AIDS. But you also say, have said that AIDS is no longer something I write about. It's part of the way I speak. Could you talk a little about how that sense of accelerated mortality mm -hmm. that you developed as a writer in the 1990s has changed your writing? My partner, Wally Roberts, we were together for 11 years, mm -hmm. um, died of age-related causes in 1994. And we lived during the last years of his life in Provincetown on the very tip of Cape Cod, a community that was very hard hit by the epidemic. Our town, which was a year-round community of 2,500 people, averaged during the early 90s a funeral a week. Constant disappearance, constant uh, disruption. We felt we were living in wartime and that the kind of struggles, the courage, the loyalty, the dramas of, of lives in those years were somehow not being seen in the wider culture. It was as if we were in a, a kind of separate little bubble right, right. of struggle. Well, so I wrote about that in some poems in very direct ways because I wanted to put the narrative of what I observed out in the world. Mm -hmm. I saw commitment and courage and loyalty and the tremendous uh, endurance and, and persistence of people who were themselves ill. Uh, I saw the, the great outpouring of support from the community to help people out. So I wanted to represent that, and, and I did in more direct poems, but poetry uh, can't solely occupy the position of directness. Metaphor mm -hmm. likes to sneak up on things. Mm -hmm. Poetry likes mm -hmm. to find uh, oblique ways to approach its material. Otherwise, it feels incomplete. So you might not know that that display of mackerel poem was written during that time. Mm -hmm. Why is the speaker in that poem so worried about the individual self right, and its right, loss? Right, well, because right. he's surrounded by bodies that are vanishing. Mm -hmm. And so the question of if a self is something you can lose, what is it in the first place is one that was crucial to me at that moment. Is there a poem, perhaps, that sure. in which you talk about that? Well, here's a poem in what? which the epidemic is represented in a very direct way. This is a narrative that comes out of the life of a friend of mine, Maggie Valentine, who was a poet who found renewed meaning later in her life by becoming a volunteer working with people with AIDS. It's called Brilliance. Maggie's taking care of a man who's dying. He's attended to everything, said goodbye to his parents, paid off his credit card. She says, why don't you just run it up to the limit? But he wants everything squared away. No balance owed, though he misses the pets he's already found a home for. He can't be around dogs or cats, too much risk. He says, I can't have anything. She says, a bowl of goldfish? He says he doesn't want to start with anything, and then describes the kind he'd maybe like, how their tails would fan to a gold flaring. They talk about hot jewel tones, gold lacquer, say maybe they'll go pick some out, though he can't go much of anywhere. And then abruptly he says, I can't love anything, I can't finish. He says it like he's had enough of the whole scintillant world, though what he means is he'll never be satisfied and therefore has established this discipline, a kind of severe rehearsal. That's where they leave it, him looking out the window, her knitting as she does because she needs to do something. Later, he leaves a message, yes to the bowl of goldfish, meaning let me go if I have to in brilliance. In a story I read, a Zen master who'd perfected his detachment from the things of the world remembered at the moment of dying the deer he used to feed in the park and wondered who might care for it, and at that instant was reborn in the stunned flesh of a fawn. So, 
Maggie's friend? Is he going out into the last loved object of his attention, fanning the veined translucence of an opulent tail, undulant in some uncapturable curve? Is he bronze chrysanthemums, copper leaf, hurried darting, doubloons, icon-colored fins troubling the water? Wonderful example also of your descriptive powers. Well, thank you. Yeah. To me, it's a poem that's so uh, concerned with this notion of attachment and detachment and the mm -hmm. way as human mm -hmm. beings we oscillate between those two poles. We want to be very connected mm -hmm. and yet we also want, want our independence. Mm -hmm. We want to be able mm -hmm. to let things mm -hmm. go. And this mm -hmm. is a man who's struggling so hard to let everything go, yeah. but there's that other side of him that reasserts itself, you know, his, his love for the world, his love for life. Um, your second memoir, Firebird, deals with growing up in Memphis between the ages of six and 16. So mm -hmm. this is very early on. In talking about this book, you said that what interested you was, quote, memory itself, the architecture memory constructs, the interpretive act of remembering, as opposed to, say, trying to reconstruct every little factual right. detail of those years. Um, I'd like you to talk about this a little more, perhaps say something about how your approach to writing memoir has changed over the course of the three books you've written in this genre. Absolutely. Well, Firebird is a, a book that is allegiant to memory. I want to follow um, my associations mm -hmm. with the child I was, what was happening in those days, that those times that are now at some distance from me, I could have written a book which was more concerned with history and, and with fact, mm -hmm. but memory to me is a very compelling subject. What we forget is as revealing about us as mm -hmm. what we remember. Memory, of course, revises the past. Um, it brings certain things into the foreground and pushes others back into the shadows. Memory shifts uh, the order of events in interesting ways. In other words, memory is a way of making narrative. Uh, and that's what we do all the time as human beings. We make stories about our lives. And sometimes those stories um, stand in front of truth mm -hmm. or stand between mm -hmm. us and truth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those stories reveal truth in unexpected ways. Here's an example. Um, in the book, I talk about my sister's wedding dress. My sister was married when she was 16 and pregnant. And she wore, very proudly, a beige suit with a mm -hmm. beige pillbox mm -hmm. hat. This was uh, what year? 1960 okay. in Memphis. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I remember her showing me that dress and wanting me to see how beautiful it was when I was, um, I was 10 years younger, so I was six years old, first grader, and I thought it was beautiful. And in retrospect, looking at that memory, I'm so curious about what my sister was doing in a beige dress. Um, <laughs> did my parents say, no white dress for you? Did she say, I am was a modern choice? woman and I'm not wearing white yeah. to my wedding because yeah. I don't want to? Yeah. Uh, what was that about? So, I talked about that uncertainty. and. In the, when I sent the book off to the copy editor, in the margins, the copy editor wrote, why don't you ask her? <laughs> and I was stunned because it had never occurred never to me. Never crossed your mind. It's not that kind of book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a different project to mm -hmm. do research about the past, to ask questions of other people, than to follow one's own questions and uncertainties. So this is very much a book about that um, problem of remembering and right. what we learn from studying our own memories. Okay. Could you read us maybe a short passage from... I would be happy to. Yeah, um, that'd be great, from Firebird. Sure. Let's see. Oh, we'll go back to first grade. Why not? Which is, is uh, you know, one of the real pleasures of writing this book was seeing what I, how much I could remember. Um, and I often thought, I, maybe I'm just making this up. And then I, I would discover that actually, when I considered it carefully, I saw um, many more uh, visual uh, bits. You know, it was like watching a movie of my own childhood that was unfolding for me. Okay, uh, this is a moment in first grade. You remember, you no doubt also had, you had Dick and Jane books. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I am the tallest boy in first grade, but I don't feel large. I am a very careful boy. I want to do well, and I'm aware of certain dangers. Take my Dick and Jane book, that reader in which little bouquets of short declarative sentences so quickly replace the new magic of deciphering the code with the boring actuality of what the symbols represent. See Puff Eat. We are each assigned a copy of the book, which we keep in our desks and are sometimes allowed to take home. 
I look ahead, curious about what else might appear on the stiff, strange-smelling pages, and right in the middle of my book is a horror. A starburst, a starburst of mold, somebody's old jelly sandwich maybe, smashed right between father and his brown fedora, just like my father's, and Dick and Spot. I'm scared my teacher will think I've done this, violated the book. I'm responsible for it, after all, and I love my book, even if it is weirdly boring and we read it so slowly as if we are savoring something as insubstantial as a slice of airy white bread. I want to hide it, but the smell is so disgusting I have to tell her, and she doesn't blame me at all. <laughs> Great. Now, I know that um, your family, well, actually your father in particular, had a very strong response to, to this book, correct? Yes, yes. And did that um, affect you as a writer when you sat down to start your next poem or memoir? That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted in this book to come as close as I could to understanding my parents' lives. Mm -hmm. uh, because they have been mysterious to me. I think it's true for most of us most as young children, people. Yes. Our parents are giant shadows on the wall. They're mm -hmm. inscrutable. Mm -hmm. Who knows mm -hmm. where they came from? Right. But who were they before we got here? So when I began to write Firebird, I was around my father's age when I was born. So that seemed to me to provide a kind of opportunity mm -hmm. for empathy with another man. I did my best to try to imagine my way into his motivation. I avoided showing the book to my father for a very long time uh, because I felt instinctively that if I imagined him as part of my audience, I wouldn't be able to write the book. It would shut you down. I had to pretend mm -hmm. that he wasn't going to read it. But finally, I couldn't pretend that because it was about to be published. And uh, the publisher, uh, the publisher's lawyers were quite insistent on him seeing the book. I gave the book to my father with the um, you know, a note that said, I know this can't be easy. Yeah. I really want to talk to you about anything that affects you, anything you can't live yeah. with here. And my father never spoke to me again. Ever heard father Never. Uh, is he still years. alive? No. Uh, he lived for five more years without speaking to me. Wow. This is every writer's nightmare, you know, that, that it, it you is. would lose someone because of it. My sister read the same book and said the best thing that a memoirist could ever hope for, which is this. She said, the things that you got wrong just make it that much more you. Huh. Which is an indication that she comment. understood that a memoir is mm -hmm. not history. It's not her memory. Right. It's mine, and that's what right. the book is exploring. I'll never know what my father objected to. Mm. Hmm. All right. Well, since we're on that subject um, of memoir, let's talk about dog years. Now, in reading this book, which I just did recently, I was struck by how unlike what I always thought memoir was, it really is. It's, it's a meditation on mm -hmm. dog ownership, yes. on dog life and dog death, and on the role that animals play in our lives. But it's also a meditation on human mortality, and it even manages to weave in the poems of Emily Dickinson. Um, as a cat person, as a lifelong <laughs> cat person, and, and you are very clear in saying it's not as big a distinction as you think. Um, I, you know, reading about those dogs, Bo and Arden, brought back every trip to the vets I ever made, and and they, through your writing, became as alive and real to me as any human character. Oh, right. And I thought it was just an extraordinary book for that reason. Thank you. Um, is there a passage you could read to sure. us from Dog Years? First, I, I want to say, in, in response to your, your wonderful comment, that I really do think this is a book about uh, love and time. Mm -hmm. that happens to have four-legged characters. Right. And it seemed to me um, an interesting way to proceed, to, to try to look at my relationship with the dogs and see um, what I might learn from them about all sorts of affection, commitment, and the experience of mortality. Yeah, you know, yeah. to love a dog is to agree to connect yourself to a creature that's probably not going to live as long as you do. Well, that's why parents get their children dogs, <laughs> so that yeah, they will yeah. learn about that. It's a kind of rehearsal, isn't it? Yeah, it is a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. All right, um, this is a little bit about a trip to the kennel. Arden's first trip to a kennel. Arden was a uh, Newfoundland lab mix big dog who was found running around in a field in Vermont. And when he had been with me a few months, of course, mm -hmm. it was time for the first trip to the kennel. I had to travel. Here we go. One kennel we visit seems like a jail for pets, with concrete floors and brilliant fluorescent lights and awful metal doors that bang and reverberate through the metal walls. 
The search for an acceptable kennel isn't an easy thing, but there's a week we have to be away. A friend from school recommends Arlene's, a place perched way back on a dirt road on a hill above the college in a zone of trailers and odd little manufactured homes. My colleague says it might not be quite what you're used to. We call, then go for a visit. Arlene is a wide woman in a flower dress who seems to have a bit of difficulty standing. She says, my leg's been bugging me, but Junior can take you out to the kennel. Junior is a thick fellow, arms and legs the same size, and his head seems made of identical material, as if he were built of tubes of clay, all extruded from the same pipe. We walk across the muddy patches and thin grass out back to a row of pens made of wire fencing, roofless, each one with a little wooden house inside. One pen has several of the ramshackle structures for the more social. It looks like the canine version of a town in John Waters movie, but we try to remind ourselves that what we seek in a kennel might well not be the things that would please a dog, and Junior does seem affectionate with the animals, and the creatures wiggling their butts in the pens are completely fine. When Arden arrives, he appears to find the place delightful. He runs up to the edge of the cages, greeting the inhabitants, much tail wagging, sniffing, friendly little barks. We're wretchedly nervous about leaving him. I suddenly feel very gay and very middle class. But he shows no signs of being the least bit bothered. And we're disciplining ourselves not to look back too much as we walk away, letting him be absorbed in his new social life in the big damp pen. Of course, we call Arlene from San Francisco a couple of days into the trip. She's as laconic as an old Vermonter could ever be. She says, he's just fine. What I want, naturally, are some details, but I don't quite know how to ask for them. So he's okay. He's doing just fine. I try again. He's adjusting okay. Pause. Arlene calls out Junior. Another pause. Shuffly noise. Phone. Bump to drop. Muffled words. And how's that new black dog? Muffled word. She gets back on the receiver. Junior says he's just fine. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a part of this book that obviously is, is mm -hmm. uh, telling stories about mm -hmm. my dog's lives. And, mm -hmm. and that is a portion of the book. But as you suggest, there's also room for meditation, questioning about these relationships, for thinking about how do we live with grief since a loss is an inevitable part of every life? Mm -hmm. How do we experience losses over time without shutting down our capacity to feel. So the book is also about depression, uh, about what it is to cease to feel. Um, and finally, there, there are those there's literary criticism in it too. There are those Dickinson poems those that you mentioned. Those Dickinson poems, yes. Well, I slipped those in on the readers. And, and you know, when you see this, this looks like, um, oh, it's a dog book. A dog book. And most readers yeah. of prose, in fact, buy books because of what they're about. I so know. people pick this up just because they're interested in the subject and then some of them are very happy to read Emily Dickinson, mm -hmm. and some of them um, may be a little more resistant, but I tried <laughs> to overcome that. Well, now, okay, so you write poetry and memoir. Can you talk a little about how you move back and forth between mm -hmm. the two? Mm -hmm. Do you write them simultaneously? Do you sit down in the morning and say, okay, today is a poetry day? Usually when I'm writing a prose book, I work on it in a very concentrated fashion, mm -hmm. day after day, because um, it's difficult to visualize the whole arc of a book if you're constantly stopping to do something else. And what I need to do in writing a memoir is to have some sense of how each section leads to the next. Mm -hmm. I don't outline it, but I want to feel a, a process of growth and development mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the writing itself. So I need to work um, every day for as long as it takes. Uh, the first draft of Firebird was written in 13 weeks um, mm -hmm. because I was lucky enough to have some time off. Uh, Dog Years was written mm, in one in two long sittings, and then both these books were revised many times. Right. The, the working process went on for a long time, but the initial work was one of roughing up the whole book and finding my f way through that. Poems, of course, are written in odd moments. Yeah. Poems are written when grace descends. Mm -hmm. If you're in a taxi or the grocery store, wherever you are, you just mm -hmm. do it when, mm -hmm. when the lines begin to come to you. Mm -hmm. And of course, you revisit those too, but it's not that kind of long, sustained attention. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. What? How do you, um, you teach mm -hmm. part of the year, one semester? One semester a year, right, at Rutgers um, University. Can you write as you're teaching, while you're teaching? Sometimes, yes. Um, I will write earlier in the semester hmm. when that pile of student work is still little. Yeah. And the more the theses come in and the research papers and the honors projects, as they start to stack up, I feel that pressure. Yeah. And, you know, creativity tends to flee when tension is present, right? I understand completely. But you've managed to keep, uh, do you still go to Provincetown? I don't. Uh, I, don't. I live in okay. Manhattan, and I have a house out on the east end of Long Island now. And you're teaching at Rutgers. And I'm teaching at Rutgers, which is in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Okay. So I have three points in my life. Okay. Um, well, we're running short on time. 
I would like to know what you're working on now and perhaps hear a bit of a new poem or? Well, I'm experimenting uh, with okay. a shorter lyric poem. And you might have noticed in a poem like the mackerel poem that it, it keeps going. Mm -hmm. it, it might arrive at what one expects to be an ending and then there's a little bit more. So this is a uh, represents uh, an experiment in not continuing on and on, but mm. seeing if I can focus the poem like a snapshot. This is called Pescadero, which is a, a, a beautiful little town south of San Francisco Bay. Pescadero. The little goats like my mouth and fingers, and one stands up against the wire fence and taps on the fence board, a hoof made blacker by the dirt of the field, pushes her mouth forward to my mouth so that I can see the smallish squared seeds of her teeth and the bristle whiskers, and then she kisses me, though I know it doesn't mean kiss. Then leans her head way back, arcing her spine, goat yoga, all pleasure and greeting, and then good-natured indifference. She loves me. She likes me a lot. She takes interest in me. She doesn't know me at all or need to, having thus acknowledged me, though I am all happiness, since I have been welcomed by the field's small envoy and the splayed hoof fragrant with soil, has rested on the fence board beside my hand. Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. It's been a real pleasure to have you. I'm really happy to talk with you, so well. it's been great. This has been Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. I'd like to thank you all for joining us.